Hello YouTube and welcome to an all new Elder Scrolls lore video. Today we'll be talking about some of the lesser known named dragons that we have encountered during our time in Skyrim and in the other provinces. Dragons made an appearance far before they were even the, ma the main theme of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim and their debuts in former games were far less consequential in the whole grand scheme of things. But they always represented some sort of importance so we'll talk about some of the lesser known dragons in previous games as well. This video will be focusing on the backstory of the lesser known dragons, so we're not talking about Alduin or Parthenex, Durnavir, Nephilalargus or anything like that. So, with that behind us, let's get into the video. Before we can start talking about the individual backstories of lesser known dragons, we need to get some context on the history of dragons out of the way and what led them to lead such miserable lives after the dragon wars in the Moretic era. The dragons considered themselves superior to man and myrrh alike and this, paired with Alduin's presence as the head of the Altmoran pantheon, gave them the incentive to rule over man. Unfortunately, the internal affairs of the dragon cult in Skyrim started to become highly corrupt and this led to newer dragon priests exerting far more power and influence over their subjects and settlements, which all ultimately led to widespread rebellion amongst their human subjects after the dragon priests, who were supposed to rule in the name of the dragons over the mortals, essentially became dictators or tyrants. So, we got the Dragon Wars, and this was a bloody civil war among the ancient populace of Skyrim. And after a bloody conflict of rebellious humans versus the dragon cult and the dragons, the rebellious humans came out on top, and the aftermath of the war after that was bloody itself as well, as the victors launched crusades against the remaining dragon priests and their dragons, eradicating all influence of the dragon cult and its proprietors, or nearly all uh, influence. Not all the ruins were destroyed, but they tried their best. The dragon priests were far more susceptible to the cruelty of these crusades as they were all eventually killed. The dragons, while they were far more powerful and had the ability to, you know, escape some of their crusades, uh, they've had an instinctive need sort of to challenge the world, seeking out someone or something that they could challenge in terms of raw power. I mean, we see this during the main quest of Skyrim where after uttering a dragon's name, he has to come to you to challenge you. And that sort of desire for challenge more than often leads to the premature defeat or death for a dragon, or at least in terms of how much death and potential their immortality offers until they're resurrected by Alduin in Skyrim. During Alduin's reign in the Meretic Era, dragons were the almighty. This bred complacency among them and in turn resulted in their eventual downfall. Some of the leftover dragons, not knowing how to handle the sudden displacements of power and the disappearance of Alduin, essentially began to panic and they tried to cling on to their past of undisputed rule. This tendency of the dragons who really couldn't deal with the fact that they were no longer on top, translated into the sacking of villages and cities where they would try to regain a sense of pride for themselves, but by that time, mankind developed efficient methods of combating them, making their poor attempts at retaliation essentially just futile. Although most were killed during and after the Dragon Wars, there was a tiny remainder of the dragons that chose otherwise. Knowing that they are highly mobile and still was somewhat immortal, some of the dragons chose to flee and hide throughout Temriel. Also choosing to form unusual alliances with kings and lords, or even just waiting in a mountain pass or something for Alduin's return. And although some of them reached the safety of the mountains or the Forgotten Passes, some have displayed the inability to wait for Alduin's return and ventured out to terrorize societies in order to satiate their lust for dominion. The last option is in some way an inadvertently suicidal act since giving in to their urges almost always led to their demise sooner or later. All of this ties into the possible fate of many of the lesser but still notable dragons that we meet in Skyrim and the other Elder Scrolls games. As I list and expand upon most of these dragons, you'll start to notice a pattern of basically self-destructiveness that envelops their demise or even their return to Skyrim. I'll also be covering the named dragons that Al Alduin resurrects, but most of them have little to no information on them. Now, those that were generally careless and went out to, you know, regain their pride and just slay villages, they were either slain by the Dragon Guard, aka the predecessors of the, Bra the Blades in the earlier eras, or by forces later, and this group is the group that we'll start off with, and since there's pretty little information on individual dragons, we'll go through them rather quickly. 
First we have the dragon Grakringdroch. This was a dragon that just couldn't wait any longer and in the year 184 of the second era went on a slaughtering spree in Winterhold, eventually being slaughtered himself by the dragon guard. Mages from the College of Winterhold were able to confirm his identity later and his name translates to Battle Courageous Lord, which is interesting as it tells you something about the dragon's personality. I'll be attempting to translate the names of the other dragons in this list as well, for so far as it's possible, as some don't have a translatable name. Next we've got the dragon Kavosin, which is what the dagger Kavosin's fang was named after. This dragon was notable in the sense that a sect of the dragon cult adamantly worshipped him specifically. The motives of this sect were even bloodier than the original dragon cult, as this sect of the dragon cult focused a great deal of their time preaching and practicing ritualistic sacrifices, which would motivate the high priest to constantly sharpen the dagger named Kavosin, so he could carry out the sacrificial killings. It's unknown if this... Uh, dagger was actually made from like bones or like a broken fang of Kavosin. Uh, it's not that likely. It's probably just named after him because it was handled by his high priest. Um, his fate is unknown. He was most likely buried in a burial mount and resurrected in lore, but not in the game, as we can't find him in the game, but we can find him in the lore. Uh, his name can't be fully translated, but the first part of his name uh, basically translates to pride. Uh, it's quite likely that he had a lot of that since he had his own cult, uh, which not all the dragons had. Uh, but more than that, we can't really say anything about it, because his name, as far as I know, can't be translated, or at least not with my Dovazul skills. Moving on, there's the dragon Mirmolnir, uh, one of great patience, yet he eventually met the same end as his brethren. He escaped extermination after the Dragon Wars and survived hidden from the Akaviri Dragon Guard, but it's said that he was last sighted in the Reach during the year 212 of the Second Era. At least that's where the Akaviri Dragon Guard's um, records end. That is, until he returned to the Western Watchtower near Whiterun to fight us as the player, the Dragonborn, uh, in during Alduin's return in the Fourth Era. After all that time spent in hiding, presumably in some forgotten mountain pass or cave or something, uh, Mirmolnir will come out of hiding to serve Alduin again. Unfortunately for him, <laughs> the last Dragonborn was his first and last challenge, as we put him down during Skyrim's introduction. His name means Allegiance Strong Hunt, alluding to a strong allegiance to Alduin. I mean, you gotta have pretty strong allegiance to remain hidden and waiting for such a long time. And his love for the hunt, which he also exclaims in his dialogue as you fight him, as he exclaims some uh, dialogue in both normal tongue and in dragon language, which all basically translate to stuff like, I forgot how fun of a hunt you mortals were, and that kind of thing. Next, we've got the dragon by the name of Krajotan, which was slain by the dragon guard during the late first or early second era. Uh, and his place of hiding was presumably in the Gerald Mountains, which was also the place where he was eventually hunted down by the Dragon Guard. The Dragon Guard actually made sure to harvest one of his fangs to mark his slaying. Uh, the fang we can actually find as an item in the Elder Scrolls Online. Strangely enough, he was called a High Dragon for some reason. Though we don't know exactly why or what makes a dragon a High Dragon. And his name can only be translated for about 60%, as we don't know the final part of his name. Though the first section of his name means Cold Maw. Although the final part of his name unfortunately can't be translated, as far as I'm aware, at least. Now, the next dragon that we'll talk about is the one that's probably most known on this list, because it's Numenex. According to ancient bard scripture, Numenex was described as a full-tempered beast that spent his olden years terrorizing villages and farms before retreating to Mount Anther, presumably repeating this cycle, probably yearly or even monthly. However, after one of his hunts, when he returned to Mount Anther to hide away, he was actually ambushed by King Olaf One-Eye, who took on Numenex with a band of his trusted soldiers. This battle with the dragon supposedly raged on for days, finally coming to a conclusion when both Numenex and Olaf engaged in a personal battle of tombs. Olaf then supposedly overpowered him and transported him to the Palace of Dragon's Reach, which was built for the purpose of housing a dragon. Other notable accounts, however, like the account of the ancient bard Svarknir, came forth with claims of fraud and deceit, claiming that Olaf and his men came upon the wounded form of Numenex atop Mount Anther, so that he actually, you know, that wasn't that much of an accomplishment. Regardless, common knowledge is that the remainder of Numenex's life was wasted away in shackles upon the balcony of Dragon's Reach. Parthenex even goes on to say that captivity changed Numenex entirely and that he witnessed his descent into madness as he visited him. Soon after Numenex died, his skull was mounted above the throne of Dragon's Reach. 
But what's interesting is that Numenex's name, Numenex, is not a name in the dragon language at all, but rather one of that the humans purposely gave to him. It's said that during his madness in captivity, and when he just basically forgot all reason, he even forgot his own name as he lost his own mind and the humans never really bothered to write the real name of Numenex down apparently. And Numenex eventually was nothing more than a beast, no longer intelligent and eventually died, despite not being slain by a dragonborn. Meaning that dragon's immortality can actually be undone under some circumstances. Now, the next dragon we'll cover is personally the, the dragon that I think has the most interesting backstory on this entire list. Similar to Durnavir, he got trapped somewhere and he suffered a pretty horrific fate. This dragon, his name was Bozikotstrun, which translates to Bold Wheeled Storm. After the brutal defeat of the dragons in the Dragon War, instead of going into hiding, he actually attempted to break conventional boundaries and fly beyond the borders of Mundus. Bozikotstrun failed in his attempt to seek refuge outside of Nurn, but his attempt actually attracted the attention of the Daedric Prince Molag Bal, who came to Bozikotstrun with an offer of safe haven and refuge in Cold Harbor, his realm of oblivion. In Bozikotstrun's weakened state, knowing that he would have an insanely difficult time hiding from the various groups scourging for him and his kin on Tamriel, Bozikotstrun accepted Molag Bal's offer of residence. A deal like this came with a pretty hefty price though. Instead of being welcomed as royalty like he'd, accept, like he'd basically expected, Molag Bal captured him and imprisoned him in the Tower of Lies where he interrogated and tortured Bozikotstrun for centuries. Nothing managed to penetrate the willpower of the dragon however because Molag Bal never managed to trick him into speaking anything in the language of dragons. And most importantly Molag Bal never got any insight into how the Dova held such a strong dominion over mortals. His defiance of Bozikotstrun remained impenetrable as Molag Bal tortured him, but Molag Bal eventually grew impatient and punished him by gradually eating the flesh from his living carcass. After all of that, only a mere skeleton remained, which was later used as a stepping stone to the creation of the first ever Daedric Titans. Daedric Titans are Molag Bal's own corrupted depictions of a dragon. Bozikotstrun's skeleton was then infused with the blood of darkness, reawakening him in the form of a vestige. His reawakening as a vestige allowed for Molag Bal to tinker with his specifications of the skeleton, and soon after Molag Bal's tinkering, the renewed skeleton of Bozikotstrun was then sunk into the Azure Chasm, where it was allowed to fully reconstitute with the help of the Azure Plasma. Bozikotstrun's corrupted form then finally arose from the chasm, commencing a long line of war slaves fit to cripple the mortals of Tamriel. Daedric Titans can actually be seen invading Tamriel during the plane melt in the Second Era, you know, the time of the Elder Scrolls Online. And their lineage of their creation can be traced back to Bozikotstrun himself from when he was tortured during, by Molag Bal and when his skeleton was used by Molag Bal. Now, the next two dragons on this list actually hit together after the Dragon War. Foslarum and Naslarum. They can be found hibernating beneath the ice of the Great Lake within the Forgotten Vale on the northwestern border of Skyrim. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find any adequate translation for their names, although their names might have something to do with sworn oaths or something like that. Uh, at least that's something in their names that can be translated vaguely to that. But don't take that from me. I mean, I don't even speak fluid English, so dragon language even less so. Uh, these two dragons, though, are both revered dragons, and the eyes beneath which they slept they seems to have preserved them well enough. They spring out of the ice as soon as they detect a player wandering near them and fighting these two is quite a challenge if you're not strong enough at that point in the game. These two dragons are essentially some sort of easter egg within the Elder Scrolls community, mainly due to their unusual place of hibernation. Uh, I believe that their presence could also be viewed as a sort of slight reference to the legend of Volcar vampires and how they were supposedly supposed to spring out of the ice and attack wanderers near remote lakes and rivers. This quickly became a myth for us after the Dawnguard DLC was released because, you know, we actually see Volkyar there. But this is how Volkyar vampires were viewed in the lore prior to the DLC. Also something interesting about these two uh, dragons is actually that if you're not uh, Dragonborn yet, so if you haven't defeated Mirmanir yet, which we talked about uh, earlier in this video, then they won't spawn from the ice. I've done some Dawnguard only um, runs uh, in Skyrim and they never spawned from the ice when I just didn't bother to start the main quest and never learned to shout. Now, the next dragon we've also talked about in the Blackreach video, um, so watch that if you want to hear more about him. It's Vulturyold, or the dragon of Blackreach as most of us know him. 
He's a figure that's basically surrounded by mystery. A majority of the Elder Scrolls lore community has a hard time finding logical justification for his place of residence and how he made it to the Caves of Blackreach in the first place. Of course, his appearance was most likely just meant to be an easter egg after all, but that didn't stop our community from delving deeper. <laughs> Uh, using the unrelenting foreshout on the illuminating yellow orb of Blackreach, or the sun, awakens Voltoriol from his slumber, uh, so presumably somewhere within a cave in Blackreach. He then proceeds to attack whoever disturbed the orb, and I honestly have no idea as to what sort of connection he has with the orb itself, he likely just woke up from the sound. Uh, regardless, this slumbering dragon falls victim to the last dragonborn, uh, if you're in the game, at least if you're powerful enough to defeat him. I've speculated a bit about his origins and about Blackreach itself in this video on Blackreach and the Silent City. I really recommend watching it as there I go into some deeper information of Blackreach which is also necessary for explaining some of the speculation around him as that's easier and this video is already very long so I won't repeat myself. Anyway, if you want to know more, watch that video. His name translates to Dark Overlord Fire, which is pretty interesting, as it at least makes me sort of think that he might have had a relatively important role in the Dragon Cult before the Dragon War. And the fact that he's so deep into, Bl into Blackreach might even be that he just didn't hear Alduin's summons when Alduin returned, so he, doesn't, he maybe doesn't even know that Alduin is back, although the dragons also have a way of sensing each other, so... Um, or at least Alduin has that way, so maybe that's not the reason, maybe he just doesn't want to return or... You know, I, don't, I, don't, I honestly don't know, I mean it's all speculation when it goes about his backstory. There's also a few uniquely named dragons that we encounter in Skyrim and beyond. These are usually encountered after Alduin or Marax resurrects them, so they usually end up swearing allegiance to their former master. Uh, Zalognir, or translated Phantom Sky Hunter, is one such resurrected dragon, and his burial mount is located near Kynes Grove. Uh, we face him during the main quest, as most of you probably know. Uh, this is also where the Dragonborn and Delphine basically witness Alduin resurrecting him during the game. Zalognir's initial death came at the hands of a Nord hero named Jorg Helmbolg in the first era, at least that's what we know about him. Jorg was one of the early tongues, so the Nords that were actually capable of shouting, and he went on to help found the first Nordic Empire, which is interesting. We basically know more about his slayer than about the dragon himself, as other than the translation of his name, we don't really uh, know much about him. Then there's the dragon Nahaglif, or Fury Burn Wither in the dragon language. He's another burial mound dragon who got resurrected and who was buried and presumably slain somewhere near Rorikstad. After his resurrection he just patrols around the village of Rorikstad, terrorizing its citizens and probably like the livestock and the source Forsworn camp in the area. Uh, we honestly have no um, backstory on him as far as I'm aware. Next we've got the dragon Vinturuth, either meaning defeat hammer command or dying hammer command. He is also one of the dragons resurrected by Alduin, but what sets him apart from the rest is that he doesn't really outright attack the Dragonborn when in the company of Alduin. After Alduin's defeat, he frequently roams around the Troth of the World and his place of resurrection is west of Anga's Mill. But other than that, again, no real backstory. Another dragon like this is Vuljotnak, or Dark, Dark Maw Eat as his name means. Uh, he's the last named dragon that we are going to cover uh, from the ones that get resurrected. And basically he's also just a regular dragon. He has a name, but there's no real lore or story behind him. He's resurrected at Great Henge Burial Mount near Sunderstone Gorge. Now we've also got the DLC. Uh, we've got some uniquely named dragons serving Mirak on Soul's Time, but I'm unsure if these were resurrected by Mirak or resurrected by Alduin. Uh, nevertheless, all of these unique dragons are on Sol's time and Apocrypha, and they serve Murak. Uh, so no matter if they were resurrected by him or not, they'll serve him now. Crossulha is a regular dragon that intercepts the player as they travel to the entrance of the Dwemer Ruin in the Char deck. Crossulha basically um, ambushes us because there's, he's a loyal dragon of Murak, and Murak tried everything to stop the Dragonborn from entering Apocrypha. He has some unique dialogue basically praising Mirak and his rightful ownership over Sol's time. This leads us to assume that Krosselha, whose name is translated means Day Mind, something like that. Uh, of In Day Mind. It's, it's, we don't really have an adequate translation. But he was a trusted ally of Mirak back in the Meretic era during his famed rebellion against the Dragon Cult. Or his uh, bend will shout of Mirak just worked so well on Krosselha that he's now actually loyal. 
out of free will or maybe he's so far under the shout that he his mind is completely altered uh, there are more dragons in Morag's surface who really aren't as interesting. Their names are as follows and can be encountered in Apocrypha. We've got Sarotar, Relonikiv and Kruzikhel. These aren't very interesting and unfortunately at the time of writing the script the Thum translator is down and still at the time of the recording. So I just translated all the previous names by hand which was a lot of fun to do. And these dragons don't really have any interesting tidbits behind them so I'll skip over them now but do keep watch of the description of this video as I might translate the names of these dragons there or at least see if there's a translation for them uh, somewhere. And then it might be in the description for their names. Um, but yeah. In the case that I also um, put these names in the description, then there will also be corrections on any translations that I might have gotten wrong. Anyway, the only real interesting of these dragons is Sarotar, whose name means Phantom Balanced Servant or Mighty Slave, uh, which is more likely personally, I think. He's Morag's personal dragon and Morag bent his will in order to make him his pet essentially. The dragonborn then later displays the superiority of this tomb to Sarathar in Apocrypha and bends his will, which allows us to mount him and then fly directly to Morag. The rest are dragons that don't really interfere with our battle against Morag, they're only there to serve as dormant souls for Morag to absorb during your fight with him. And again, there's no real lore behind them. An honorable mention after all this is the dragon Dragona Papre from an Elder Scrolls legend Battlespire. Papre was tremendous in size and lived inside the Battlespire during the Third Era. He was known for being the companion of an Imperial battle mage called Samar Starlover. He was supposedly to aid his companions Samar and the other battle mages in their attempt to repel Maroon's Dagon and their his Daedric forces from invading the Battlespire. Unfortunately, the Daedric forces eventually overwhelmed them and killed him before Samar could reach his lair. So, yeah, not much other story on him, but he's a good mention. Now, in the next segment, I'll be covering the Dova that are alive or those that have fled from their last known location. Ahilok is the next name of the dragon on this list, whose name I unfortunately failed to translate. What he did manage to do, however, was successfully evade the various dragon hunts. Past reports of the Dragon Guard actually suggest that he was last spotted in the northern Yarol Mountains. The Dragon Guard pursued these leads but failed to catch him on multiple occasions. Further reports suggest that he eventually fled towards Morrowind after the Dragon Guard's initial failure to slay him. The last possible trace of Ahilok is actually from the Dunmer enchanter Brarilu Teron. He was a master enchanter at the time and the author of the book Twin Secrets. He claims to have come into contact with some dragon in Vardenfell, but he refused to actually reveal the name of said dragon. It's a pretty good chance that this dragon might have indeed been Ahilok using the ashy ruins of the Red Mountain to shield himself from the public. But other than that we don't really know much about him. The next dragon on this list is actually questionable in the sense that I'm not even sure if it's a real or natural dragon, but I'll include it anyway. Toshraka, or the Tiger Dragon, is said to have been an emperor of Kapotun on the continent of Akavir. Kapotun was home to a catfolk-like race, who was a bit like the Khajiit, but different at the same time. And Toshraka was their emperor. The legend surrounding him states that he apparently managed to turn himself into a dragon. The methods which allowed his transformation were never actually uttered, but some even claim that it granted him divinity. His image was viewed and known as the Akaviri avatar of Akatosh. And after the Seisi tried to enslave or kill all of the dragons on Akavir, most of the dragons migrated to Tamriel during the early Meretic era, but some actually stayed on Akavir and fled to the Kapotun to wage territorial wars with these cat-like folk. Even though the Potun won, this great war actually debilitated them and they sought to transform into dragons, seeing as how powerful only one dragon could be. Toshraka was apparently the first one who actually managed to undergo such a transformation and shortly after his ascension to the throne he renamed the nation that they previously lived in to Kapotun and he vowed to kill the Seisi before conquering the entirety of Tamriel and Akavir. Although obviously he never actually did as we're still living under the Empire or the Old Navy Dominion. Last we have Shulkanak whose name basically means Guide of the Sun and Moonlight or Sun Moonlight Guide. Uh, the last dragon on this list, uh, Shulkanak is part of the Elder Scrolls Blade storyline and he plays a small role in the quest facing a dragon. 
There the player basically approaches the dragon in a request of information regarding the appearance of the Sorcerer King Salamaril. Uh, I recommend watching the video on Blade Storyline if you want to know more about this. Uh, essentially after he recognizes you as a former member of the Blades or you know the later Dragon Guard, Shokunax fights the player yet with no real motive to kill him, he just wanted to see if the fugitive was strong enough to rival the Sorcerer King. Shukunax faked past the Elder Scrolls Blades is unknown, he probably fled or he's still you know, in the cave where we find him, which is supposedly a very remote place. Anyway, that was a very long list of lesser known dragons and I definitely hope that you learned something. Now, before I end this video, I want to thank my friend Sith who majorly helped out researching this video. His channel is in the description, he also makes Elder Scrolls and Witcher content. And also a huge thanks to my top patrons, Mr. Bernardo Binda, Gabriel Binda, Christmas and Zara Mikhail. These amazing people along with all the other Patreon supporters on screen keep this channel in the air. And for that I'm very grateful. So, with that behind us, I will see you all in the next Elder Scrolls lore video. See ya!